While you're doing that, last weekend, uh, we introduced what I think is uh, an exciting faith-building opportunity that we're inviting many of you to consider. Uh, and it's based on a Bible verse we looked at last week, a promise that God has for you from Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. And so for those of you who weren't here last week, and I want to quickly review that, and then I want to tease out a couple things uh, because this is a, uh, an opportunity that gives us a chance to talk about how God works in our lives. And so the verse we're looking at is from Malachi 3, verse 10. And God says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse. Now the tithe means 10%. Uh, some people think, well, if I'm giving, I'm giving a, a tithe. A tithe is a specific amount. It's 10%. In the Old Testament days, that would have been uh, the first 10% of your crops or your animals. But for us, it's money. So for every dollar we make, God is inviting us to give 10% back to his church, the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house and thus put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you an overflowing blessing. So we saw last week that the word test, where God says, put me to the test, that's the same word that we would use when we put gold through fire to test its purity, to test its metal, so to speak. And so what God is saying here is he is inviting us, he's challenging us to give 10%, a dime for every dollar we make, to his work, and he will use that as a way to prove his faithfulness to us. It's through our tithing that God proves his metal, that he proves that he's faithful to us. And God says that when you do that, I will pour down for you an overflowing of blessings. So the, the uh, invitation that we have for you is this. We want to invite you, if you've never tithed before, never given 10% of your income to the, the work of uh, building the kingdom of God, we want to invite you for 60 days, starting September 19th and 20th, to give 10% to the church. And if after 60 days, God doesn't bless you, however you define that, you just need to send a letter to the church, and one person will see that letter, and we will refund 100% of your money. And so it's one of those offers that really is too good that it is true. Either God's going to bless you, or you're going to get your money back. Because we want you to experience the power of God's promise in your life. Now, um, what I want to talk about for just a moment is what does it mean that God's going to pour out an overflow of blessing on your life? And so this gives us not only an opportunity to, to sort of test God's faithfulness as he invites us to, but to talk about how God works in our lives. And there is, quite honestly, a lot of really bad theology about blessing in the Christian church today. And so I want to talk just for a couple minutes about how God blesses us, irregardless of tithing. Uh, my daughter sent me a link to a, uh, a clip on YouTube, a uh, show featuring John Oliver. How many people know what I'm talking about? All right, it's good to be among just the hippest in the room, right? Uh, John Oliver used to be on The Daily Show, and he has his own show. I think it's on HBO, and he's a, a uh, comedian, but he's really a social critic in many ways. He uses comedy to critique society. And one of the um, social, cultural phenomenons he took on uh, in this particular clip, with televangelists. And particularly those televangelists who believe in what we call prosperity gospel, that if you give, God will reward you financially and you'll become wealthy. And so he looked at many of these different televangelists and what they do to try to get you to give money, and it turns out, this wouldn't surprise you, that the only people who really get rich off of that scheme are the televangelists. And so he showed the story of a couple of them who had $65 million that people had given them, and they paid cash for their own private planes. Now, it works great for the televangelists, but it usually doesn't work for the people who are giving money, and the reason why it doesn't work is because it's not biblical. When we say that we give money so that God will give us money, we turn God into a slot machine, Right? We put money in, we pull the little arm, or we push the button, and then God's going to just spit out money. Or we turn God into a magic genie who can be bribed with our gifts, and if we just rub that thing hard enough, he's going to give us more and more. Essentially, that theology starts from the wrong position. It's an if-then theology. If I give, God will bless me. But biblical theology is always because therefore. Because God gives... I give. Because God has blessed me, I want to be a blessing to others. 
If you give to get something, it's not really giving, is it? It's just purchasing something. It's a transaction. Giving should be, giving as you know, you give without any expectation whatsoever of return. That's the biblical model. And yet in this verse, God says, but if you do give, I'm going to bless you. Because that's the way God is. God just can't help himself. He's just constantly giving. But there's something that God wants to say to us in this particular verse through this particular act of obedience. And the question is, so what does it mean that God will pour out an overflow of blessing? And so to give you just an example, I, I want to read a quick little excerpt from a book called The Blue Zones. I mentioned last week I'm reading this book. Um, it's a, a guy named Dan uh, Butner who with National Geographic went out and did a, a study, an in-depth scientific study, on the four areas in the world where people live the longest. And not just live the longest, but live the healthiest. These are people, they have more people over 100 than the average areas, and these people over 100 are extremely healthy. I mentioned the story last week of the 100-year-old in the book here who every day gets up and she gets on her stationary bike, pedals 30 miles an hour for eight miles, and then does weightlifting, and she's 100 years old. So he has a story here. He's in Costa Rica, and I'm guessing if most of you thought Costa Rica, whatever you know about it, you wouldn't think that's the healthiest place in the world, but it's one of the healthiest zones in the world. He's just been at the house of a 100-year-old woman who cooked him a meal. And as he and his assistant are walking back to their place, this was the conversation they had. On the way back, I told Elizabeth that I agreed with her, uh, with her observations regarding faith and longevity. Panchita's faith, she's the 100-year-old, was amazing. Her unwavering belief that no matter how bad things got, God would take care of everything. Indeed, thinking back, I realized that most of the 200 centenarians I had met believed in a similar guiding power. I asked Elizabeth if faith really has a profound impact on longevity. Absolutely, she said. When Gianni and I were doing our interviews, we noticed that when you ask the most highly functional seniors how they are, they always say, I feel good thanks to God. Yet they may be blind, deaf, and their bones hurt, but psychologists call this external locus of control. In other words, they tend to relinquish control of their lives to God. The fact that God is in control of their lives relieves any economic, spiritual, or well-being anxiety they may otherwise have. They go through life with the peaceful certitude that someone is looking out for them. I'd heard of a study that echoed their findings. In this study, participants who attended religious services about once a month or more had up to a 35% reduced risk of death for the next seven years. In his other book, he said that people who give tend to worry less about money. And by the way, the most generous people are not the wealthiest of us. The most generous people tend to be middle class people and poor people. So what's the blessing? When God says that he will pour out an overflow of blessing, the blessing is himself. It's his grace. It's his love. It's his mercy. When we let go of that 10%, we're giving access to God to control our lives. And it changes everything. To realize when I've let go of 10%, and all of us think about that 10% and how we could use that in our lives, and we're just going to let that go, and you trust God, it builds faith, it builds capacity, it builds hope, it builds joy. The overflow of blessing that God gives to us is himself and his grace. And people who are generous tend to experience less worry, uh, less concern about their life because they've surrendered control of their lives to God. That's why this is important to God. That's why tithing tests his character. He wants to prove himself to you. Now look, if God wants to bless you with financial reward, I'm not going to argue with that. I think that's great. But if we give to get, we haven't really discovered the power and promise of God's faithfulness. So the purpose for this particular exercise isn't to get more money for the institution. That's why we're giving you a money-back guarantee. It's not about funding the church. It's about you experiencing the depths of God's faithfulness in your life, and he's asked you to try him on this one, to test his mettle and see if he doesn't prove himself faithful. So if God doesn't prove himself faithful to you, then we'll give you all your money back, and it'll give, come just in time for Christmas for you to do all your Christmas shopping. So uh, if you did not receive a letter from me this week outlining this event and the card that comes with it, please stop by out in the lobby. We've got a letter. And for those of you who are already tithing, your invitation is to join in praying for those who will be on this grand experience and adventure. And uh, you have already know that it'll change their lives. So I know you're excited.